I uh, forgot to do dot slash hiding in my org mode file. Then throws like a weird reference link inside the document that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, email me when those happen because they're sneaky. Kurt, do you know the um, 3D visualization program Blender at all? Uh, a little bit. There's a person in here who knows more than I do, and he happens to be sitting that by guy? that door. Okay. <laughs> ben has done some cool stuff, and Roland has done some Blender stuff oh, okay. too. Cool. It's pretty powerful. Also, the other one that's uh, pretty interesting is SketchUp, but there are different kinds of programs. They're both 3D. SketchUp is less about the animation, and Blender is more about creating a full movie. And I started trying to look at the Python stuff within it, and uh, it uses Python 3. It's a different versions, though. If you look around, mm -hmm. there's... Uh, yeah, the version I had. Is sort of, yeah. My mouse disappears when I think I'm You could try rebooting your virtual machine. You might need to go up to the menus and do like a hard restart on it. So when you bring it back up, it's just coming right up. I would suggest if you can get up there and do an actual reboot from the power button. Uh -oh. um, when you close it, it might just do a hard suspend and you might end up stuck with the same problem again. You have totally no mouse in there, huh? Try under file or virtual machine, maybe. What have we got in there? Power. Send control, alt delete, maybe power. Yeah, do a, try a reset from right in there. Yeah, that looks more like a restart. Okay. It was going a little fast before. If that fails, then you can always reboot the whole Windows machine because maybe it's something to do with Windows and its handling of the yeah, mouse. And the first thing we're going to do today for lecture 19 is I'm going to do a reminder on logging in IPython in a way that when your computer gets rebooted by a brownout, you won't lose it. We'll have to uh, make sure that we log things ourselves so that if we get another brownout, it won't be too catastrophic. And today we're going to go over more bags. We're going to finish up doing a uh, histogram of the elevation. We're going to look at the uncertainty because uncertainty is important. So that'll be using HDF5 and then we'll be using matplotlib for our plotting. Then we're going to dig into the metadata with XML. So I know this is not the most simple XML to start with, but bear with me and try to hang in there on the XML. We'll, we'll do a lot of it for the last month and a half of this class. And then by Kitchen Sink, if we can make it to there, we'll be playing with shape files and coastlines to go with our metadata. And hopefully, either, probably not this class, but by the end of next class, hopefully we'll plot up the bounding box from the metadata in an actual shoreline database from the GMT group, which is actually called the GSHHS. So you'll see the bounding box on a map and you can see that it makes sense, unlike some of the other bounding boxes I've seen from metadata. So let's start off and kick off IPython and remember how to do that logging. We'll do it again. Remember that you can do percent quick ref. Quick ref will, and this will actually bring up a uh, cheat sheet of various things. So if you hit enter, you'll be in this list of general overview of IPython, and you can use the arrow keys and space to go down. You can also search in this one with a slash right next to your shift key, and then you can type log. Not too important because you can just page through it, but there's log off, log on, log start, log state, log stop. So it's all documented in there. It's also in the notes. So we'll do log state and logging has not been activated. So we'd like to start some logging. We say log start. Put a question mark after it and you can get some help, more detailed help on log start. And the key thing is that we can say log name. So you can call it whatever you want. So we can do percent log start and then the name of the log file that we want to write. So log dash class dash 19 dot py. It's logging into a Python format. You can pick another name if you like. This is just the name that I chose. Hit enter and it should show you some information about what it's doing that I haven't totally looked up all of those things. Logging into the, your local directory, your working directory. I'm just going to show you. Perfect question. So if we do an ls, we should now see a log file. We can do, remember that you can do an exclamation point to get back to the bash shell. So we can use the head command and log class and I'm going to hit enter and you will see the beginning of your log file. So it's always good to, with these things to make sure when you're trying to log something and it's important to you, make sure it's actually doing it. I've definitely myself gone through stuff, got to the end, 
I uh, recorded a video for this class. I got to the end, hit save, and I played it back and there was no audio. So I had recorded a half an hour of video with no audio and was very, very bummed. So it's always good to check that what you're doing works. So that's the basics of logging. There's, I think, more that you can do, but I won't get into that. We're going to do something fun for a change. We've been really pushing a lot of uh, Emacs and heavy duty stuff at you. So we're going to try a really important Python module, import anti-gravity. This is a very important module. It has lots of uses in Python. So hit enter. If you know the cartoon XKCD, you should see a little cartoon about Python. Sorry, Ben. This is where he describes leaving Perl. <laughs> so there's uh, some jokes hiding in things that are at least a little fun. So it's not all serious. Well, just to get you back, my Python said failed to create drawable. Uh, yeah, I got that too. I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. So now we're going to try to quickly go back through what we did last time. We're going to get the bag loaded in. So here's the structure of what we're going to be loading in. I left it up here from last time. We're going to be loading up the elevation, the metadata. I looked in a tracking list or two and never found anything. So if anybody knows of a bag file with some tracking list info, that'd be nice to know. And then we'll do uncertainty also. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that, that you don't have the file from last time. And we'll go into the section getting back to where we were. Meta W to copy that line. And I'm going to paste a wget command with a bang in front of it to run the shell command inside of IPython so we don't have to jump back and forth. So there I've got a little exclamation point hiding. Careful you don't click on this. There's active links or inside of the uh, terminal. So if there's a URL in here and you click on it, you're going to end up with extra files running around. So you can hit enter. Since this is again locally hosted, it should be pretty quick. Then I believe we need to uncompress it and make sure it's all there. So we'll say bang b unzip 2 h1 and press tab to complete that file. Press enter, should go pretty quick. And then you can do an ls-l to make sure that you actually have the file in there uncompressed. So here is our bag from last time that we'll be using. Now that we've got this bag file, we can start working with it again. So let's go ahead and bring in the modules we're going to need today. The first one we need is numpy, import numpy. We're also going to need h5pi for our hdf reading, so import h5pi. And then we need to bring in plotting from matplotlib, so from matplotlib, import pyplot. So the numpy part of that and the pyplot part of that came in with the dash dash pylab in the past that I'm now avoiding. We're now ready to go ahead and load up a bag file. So we'll say bag, which should be our variable name, equals h5pi, period, capital F, tab, and you'll get file, left parenthesis, single quote, and you can type the H and just hit tab. And we only have one bag file in this directory, so it makes it extra easy to complete. And press enter, should load up pretty quick. So before we pulled it apart, so I'm not going to go through that too much, we're going to take a quick reminder of the fact that we can do, I didn't show this last time, we can say our bag.keys, and this works just like a dictionary. So keys is the same thing that works on a dictionary, and there's only one top level key, so that gives us our bag root. We can then say bag sub bag root, and run keys on that, and we get the lower level, so that went into here, listed the keys for bag root, and we got those four guys down here. So let's go ahead and grab our elevation. Elevation equals bag, bag root, the underscore in there, slash elevation. I like to see how many typos I make, and then value. So this is going to reach in there and grab the value section of our elevation. And we're going to double check that with type elevation. We have a numpy.nd array, that's good. We can say elevation.size and shape. So that looks pretty good. Now last time, if we just say elevation, hit enter, we had all these one millions that are the, uh, the data value that's put in when there isn't data at a particular cell in our grid. And we had this big for loop, 4x, 4y, and then if each cell was greater than zero, stuff a numpy.nan in there, 
And there's actually a lot faster and shorter way to write this. I think if you're beginning, it's really confusing. But I'm going to show you uh, how to do this. And it's, it's basically, um, you can make a Boolean test and then do an assignment. And this is pretty fancy stuff. I'm not totally sure I'm comfortable with it, but it works really well, so we'll, we'll use it. So we'll say elevation. And inside the square brackets, so elevation greater than 0 equals numpy dot nan. So in, in the notes, you'll see the for loop in comments. But this is a, a way that's really compact. So if you're typing a lot of stuff and you get comfortable with it, you can do a lot of manipulations with matrices very easily. So we took the elevation matrix or array. It's a 2D array. This is the check on each cell. So if that cell is greater than 0, it will then assign into that cell a numpy.nan. In here, this actually builds a second matrix that's true and false for every cell. And it uses that to figure out when to do that assignment. The documentation is incomprehensible, in my opinion, for numpy. Somebody said, oh, just read the documentation, and I tried. But this will run a lot faster than the way we did it before. So if you hit Enter, it comes right back. So if you're doing a lot of manipulations of matrices and arrays, this is the way to do it. Uh, uh, what is elevation in this case? Is that depth? Yes. So in this case, in the bag format, they call our bathymetry elevation. OK, but why more than 0? Because there are some area. I'm being lazy. So I didn't go in there and look and see if like if this were LiDAR data, it could actually go maybe up onto the shoreline. There's actually some topographic LiDAR in some of the bags. Maybe there are some connections for the vertical data. There's also that too. If we look at the histogram in a little bit, you'll see that I guessed right. So what I would do typically, I would have looked up in the metadata that 1 million was the uh, no value. And I would have written something very specific to that value. So I'm being lazy. I probably should have written something like greater than 9999. Something like that would have been safer. So I could do that too. And that would be a lot safer than using the zero. That's a great question. Sometimes being lazy, you get away with it. And other times you'll get bit. Watch out with floating point numbers. If you try to use equals with a floating point number, your chances of getting what you expect are pretty small. Floating point numbers have lots of rounding problems with them. So if you try to say two, two different values are the same, you might get nailed by a you know, 10 to the minus 7 problem. So now we have our array. Let's go ahead and start up a plot. Now this came up a few classes back. We're going to turn on the matplotlib interactive mode so that we don't have to have the first show come up and we have to kill the figure. So we'll say pi plot interactive. You can always do a question mark to get help. Not very helpful. But if we say true, we won't now have to do uh, a show on our first figure and it won't lock up the, the terminal here. So now we can go ahead and tr create our first figure. So pi plot dot figure one. And it should pop up a display. And we can say pi plot. Now remember, we can't use plot. We have to, since it's a 2D matrix, we have to treat it like a picture. And so we'll say I am hit tab show. And then we'll say elevation. Oh, don't want to do that. I'm going to comment that out for a second by doing a control A and then a pound. I actually want to have you guys start using the subplot feature. So we can have, we're going to have the, uh, the elevation and then a histogram for the elevation, the uncertainty and a histogram for the uncertainty all in one figure. So it's something more like what you do if you have lots of plots up. If they're all over your screen, they get a little confusing. So it's good to organize things. So we'll say pi plot dot subplot. In this, you'll say the number of rows and then the number of columns, so two and two. And then the third number is which one of those figures counting from the top left we're going to be in. So we'll do subplot 221. And that's now put us up in the top left hand corner building a graph. We go back to this pi plot command, I'll remove the pound at the front that I had, hit enter. So before we had to do a show, and then it would lock up the terminal. We'd have to kill the figure, and it'd be gone. So now we have our nice bathymetry up on the top left. And just to give you a hint, we're gonna. This is a, a lovely place up in Alaska. And now we can move on to the histogram. So we need for our histogram to convert our 2D array into a 1D array. 
And there's probably a lot better ways to do it than what I came up with here. There's probably another one liner that you can do, but so what we're going to do is I'm going to say E data for elevation data equals, and I'm going to reshape the matrix into a 1D a matrix. So we'll say elevation dot reshape. And again, you can do a question mark after that. Oops. Uh, if it's in the middle of an expression, it doesn't always like to do the question mark. So if you have the little E data equals, it's not going to give you the help. So here's elevation reshape. So we'll say E data equals. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass it in the total size. So before it was a width and a height, we can ask for the size, which would be a 1D matrix of that length. So we'll say elevation size like that. Hit enter. Now just type E data and take a peek at it. And now we have those NANs hiding in there that we don't want. So we need to create a new list that doesn't contain any of the cells that have NANs in them. So we'll say E data clean. That'll be our list without NANs in it. I make an empty list with two square brackets. And then we can say for I in range length. So we'll do the length of, and then we'll just say E data. Uh, elevation size, uh, line 56. Okay. The resize or the reshape. So this one, we're going to reshape it from a square into one long array. This size is the total number of cells. So it's the width, in our case, it's the width times the height. Can you give back the number of rows and number of columns? This gives back, so reshape takes okay. the how many rows and columns, and it can actually be n dimensional. So you can have lots of dimensions. So we're going to give it back. So it's going to say, for the first dimension, what's my size? For the second dimension, what's the next size? And so this is just going to have a, basically a width, but no height. So this will be the number of cells. So this is going to be width times height in here. So if you wanted to make that square again, or rectangular, you could say elevation dot reshape. And then you could say something like 1080, 2400, or something, whatever the numbers of the cells were. And that would turn it back into a rectangle. We've just taken the thing and mushed it out long. All right, so back to our for loop. So we'll do for i in range the length of our 1D array. And then inside of there, we're going to say if e data sub i. So we're going to look into one cell in there. And we're going to put a not in front of it because we don't want it to be. And then there's a command to tell if it's got a NAN. And that's going to be numpy.isNAN. So that will be numpy.isNAN. So that will return true if this is a NAN. We want to flip that because we only want it to be true when it's not a NAN. I have the wrong number of parentheses, it looks like, or something. So for i in range length e data colon if not numpy dot is nan e data i this is getting really ugly so I'll just watch for a second while I get this right and then we'll come back to it so then once we're in there if it's not nan then we'll say e data clean dot append equals e data um, I. So it's going to run. This is what I get for not looking over at the text next to me on the paper. This is the command that I'm going to run and it should be right. So it's running, running, running. Let's make sure it's good. It seems to be happy. And if I hit the up arrow, we'll get back to it and so you can see the whole thing. It's also directly in the class notes in the org file. Let me get back to the org file so we can see it. So we'll say is nan. All right, so it's this right there. That's what it should look like. And I was cheating by not looking and I paid for it. So now if we say control U, get rid of that. We'll say length of E data. See what we got? That's how many cells we have left in our new and in before we uh, 
removed it, and we can say <laughs> length edata clean. So this is how many after we got rid of all the NANDs. So what we can do is we can say length of edata minus length edata clean. And this is going to tell us how many NANDs we actually got rid of. And this is, I'll do one more command for you that isn't in the notes, but it's just kind of nice to see. So that's how many NANDs we have. We'll divide that by our total number, so length e data. Now, we have to watch out that we're going to do a divide, and we have integers and integers, so we'll say float of that. Hit enter. 92% of that bag is no data. So when you unpack one of these bags, the old version of the format didn't do any compression. Most of what you're storing on the disk with the bag was empty space with nothing in it. Making it this way, we have a vector in each time it's increasing. The yep. Size. In the for loop? Yes. Maybe some way to avoid this uh, long operation. Yes. Um, if you change this guy right here, the range. If you use a command called xrange, which I haven't covered, it won't create an actual array. At this point, it's not worth worrying about. You can get a lot fancier. I'm trying not to get fancy. Especially for if you're beginning, I can make code that you won't follow that'll be really cool and fun. But I'd rather stick with stuff that you have a better chance of following the first time. I can just put the number. Oh, in terms of this, like doing this down here? There's, there's lots of ways you can do this. Like as you saw with, we did a for loop in the first one to, to set the NANDs that went from the other values. There was multiple ways to do that. We could probably come up with five or six different ways to do this. So let's go ahead and build a histogram. So if we say pi plot subplot, let's go give ourselves, so two, two was our dimensions, and now we're gonna move on to number two. So three twos in a row, hit enter. And if we find our figure over here, we now have a magical second figure on the top right. And now we can say pi plot hist for histogram. We can say e data clean bins equals 100. So this is going to make 100 different bins in our histogram. And we'll hit enter. And so now what we've got is a nice figure that's Something that I wish came with every bag right away. You've got a little plot showing you what your data looks like. So you can see there's like some deep areas in the middle of these, uh, these little patches. And you can see their data runs from minus 50 meters, so that's 50 meters depth. So if you say depth, you tend to use positive numbers. If you say elevation, negative is down. So minus 50 elevation to about minus 108 meters. So it's actually fairly deep in this area at least in terms of a ship, not deep by the ocean standards. So now we've covered the uh, elevation from before, and it's time to jump into the uncertainty, where you might not know what to expect in terms of uncertainty for the data. I certainly didn't, and I've definitely seen some funky uncertainties in some of the earlier bags. Let's go ahead and load up that uncertainty into a variable. Not the best variable names. I wasn't being very creative this morning when I was writing that up. So we'll go ahead and set uncertainty. We're going to pull it out of the bag, pull a rabbit out of the hat. We're going to go into the bags with a square bracket, a single quote, a slash, bag root, slash uncertainty dot value. And you can type type of uncertainty. Always good to make sure everything is happy. We also, to change it up a little bit, you can type who's with an S on it and you'll see all of your data. So hopefully uncertainty is hiding in here somewhere. So this is not a terrible representation. So here it shows it's an ND array. It shows us the width and the height. Total number of elements, it's a float 32-bit. How many bytes, which is 10 megabytes. So by today's computer standard, it's not too much data. So here we're looking at, in the section, looking at uncertainty. That was the command that I ran. So let's take a peek. So we had the shape, we got that from the who's, but we can also do it from uncertainty.shape. It's going to give us our width and height, 
We can ask it the minimum. Unfortunately, I forgot the parentheses, and it's a function, not just a value, so we need or the two uh, parentheses. The minimum value in the uncertainty is 0.218. I don't have a good intuitive feel for what 0.281 uncertainty means. But then we can do max, and we get that same 1 million. So we have the same problem with NANDs that we had before with the elevation. So we can remove those. We can say uncertainty, square brackets, and we can say uncertainty. I'm going to take a wild guess, greater than 1,000. I'm pretty sure uncertainty runs in the 0 to 1 range, equals numpy dot nan. Make sure that's what I've got. In the notes, I use greater than 1, but we'll try greater than 1,000, since that was brought up as being trouble before. So you hit enter, it goes really quickly. And let's give that a plot so we can actually see what's in there. So we'll say pi plot, and now we're going to do our subplot again. And we want to go, so it's 2 by 2 again. So this is 1 up here in the top left, 2 in the top right, and we're going to do 3 over here. So 2, 2, 3, enter. And if we look at our plot, we now have a blank third graph. So let's plot, pi plot, and again we have to do the image show and uncertainty. So hopefully, if I hit enter, we will have a view of uncertainty. I'm uncertain about the uncertainty. Please work. Oh, there we go. I don't have a good intuitive feel for uncertainty. I haven't worked with it too much. But this is at least a view of the uncertainty. And like one of my early fears with multi-beam data, and I looked at the bags, is that I saw lots and lots of data with the same uncertainty. And I wasn't sure why that was the case, because I definitely tell you that there are areas with greater and less than uncertainty in the data when you look at it up close in the raw data. So here we can see it's definitely different. We have a couple little patches. We can also rerun our min and max. We can say uncertainty. The min shouldn't change because we didn't fiddle with the low end of things. Unfortunately, the NAND throws off the min and the max. So um, we're going to have to wait for our histogram to see what the range of uncertainties are. All right, so we need to go through and do the same exact building of uh, 1D array without NANDs in it. So we can say u data equals uncertainty dot reshape. Watch out for my tabs again. If you notice, I hit tab twice in there. There's 63 three times. Uncertainty dot size, so a 1D array. And this should give us a 1D array. So that's what I did in the notes. Yes. And now we're going to create an empty U data clean. We're going to go fill that up with a for loop again. So for I in range length of U data, if not numpy is nan. Tab is really bad inside of this kind of stuff. Sorry about that. U data sub I. And it's in the notes in in here, so if we scroll down, you can, if you're trying to follow something, don't follow the screen up there for a minute. Follow the stuff in the org file, because that actually works for sure. We'll say u data clean dot append u data sub i. So if the data value is not a nan, we want to stick it on that array. Hit enter a couple times until it runs. And now we should be able to type u data clean just to get a quick view of it. And you'll see all the values going through there for 200,000 plus ones. So it's a great way to fill your screen up with junk. So we want to do a histogram of that. So we'll do a pi plot subplot. So again, it's the 2, 2 for the width and the, the rows and columns of our plot. And then we're now on number four. Remember again that PyPlot follows MATLAB, so we counted from one, not zero, like most of Python. So if we hit enter after that, we now have a blank one for number four. And we'll say PyPlot hist u data clean. And so now we're going to have our first view, really, of what the range of, except for I don't like it with that few bins. So we'll do, again, bins equals 100. Yuck. I'm going to be brave and type a CLA. 
pyplot.cla and hope it doesn't wipe out all of them. So take a good look before I destroy everything <laughs> I've done. I didn't like that this, these two graphs, you can keep adding on to a graph and it starts changing the scale. We can basically see that it goes from 0.2 to 0.5 or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I'm going to hit enter. Hopefully that works and clears. Yep, I got lucky. <laughs> I haven't done that before. So we're going to replot that histogram and it's much better. So here we can see we have a nice histogram showing us that we have a couple values that are the uncertainty is 0.9. And I'm guessing that low uncertainty probably means you know more about the data. And as uncertainty gets high, the data you, you know less about that value and you're, you're not sure that it's a good sounding value. Now, hopefully in your other classes, because I'm not going to give you this intuition here, by the end of the year, I would hope that you have, if you look at this histogram, you'd have a good sense of how good or bad that data is. I don't. None of the processing I've ever done has had uncertainty in it. Most of my multi-beam work was done before Cube and things like that were done. So I don't have a sense of that. I can't really help you with that. You can ask some of the NOAA folks or some of the other staff who've worked a lot with uncertainty and get a better sense of, of what that means. So you're welcome to grab that figure and show them and say, what does that mean? So now we're going to go from the land of obvious pretty pictures and the land of XML and angle brackets. Say goodbye to the pretty picture. And we'll get a different pretty picture, hopefully, by the end of class. But no more pretty bathymetry. We're going to just go for a bounding box. Normally, when you do a plot, I have a little comment here that you should label everything. We're cheating here. We're not labeling anything. So please don't do that in your figures for class and for your work. Now we're going to go into XML. I think I'm going to be a little hard on your, your brains here in terms of throwing in a lot of material. So just try to get a feel for XML in this class. We'll see it. We've seen it a little bit before. We'll see it a whole lot more as we go through it. And I'm going to show you some actually really advanced techniques because I feel like XML without those advanced techniques is a pain because parsing text is never very fun. We're going to load up that metadata and we're going to use something called XPath to search inside of XML and it makes XML really easy because you can go grab any tag you want out of that data and use it. Now all the little edge cases and figuring out all the details of special things can get hard but the easy cases are really hopefully fairly easy. And you'll see here, we'll be able to pull out the bounding box for that bag. We'll be able to pull out the title and the abstract fairly easily. And then we can write ourselves a little KML, which is a type of XML. And then we'll load that up in Google Earth. And you'll be able to see the bounding box for this chart right on a map with some uh, air photos from Google Earth of the area. And you'll see it. Ben? Could you give a brief overview of the purpose of XML? Sure. The purpose of XML, so we've got lots of different ways of storing data, like HDF5 is a way of storing things. XML is a text format that's supposed to be human readable, in air quotes. In that stream of human readable stuff, it's got angle brackets and things called tags around different uh, variables that you'd like to store. That makes it easier for machines to parse and pull out the text between those tags. And it has a sort of a tree structure, kind of like this, and in there, We'll be storing a lot of variables, and you'll be able to access them and build out these structures. And you can have repeating data structures through the, uh, these things. It's one of many formats that are similar. It just happens to be probably the most popular one right now. That's sort of a high-level view of XML in terms of what it's used for. So it's a data storage format that you could pick it up, look at it as a human, and have a chance of reading some of it. Unlike if you pick up an HDF5 file and we look, looked in there, it's going to be just binary stuff. We're going to go through looking at these files, and hopefully you'll start to see the what and the how of them by example. So first, we're going to bring in the module that we're going to use to parse XML. I use a library called LXML. I tend to like it more than the ones that come with Python because they tend to be a little bit more obscure. So we'll say from LXML import, and we're going to use the E tree or element tree. There's lots of different styles of ways to parse XML. Uh, the eTree way seems to be fairly easy compared to the other ones, at least in my opinion. And let's go ahead and load up that metadata like we did last time. And here I've mixed in the join that we did last time. Since in the bag format there's a quirk and that it stores the metadata as an array of strings that are of length one, as opposed to a string of length of the text. 
I, I managed to cause some good discussion on the uh, NavSurf bag mailing list yesterday over this. So <laughs> I'm going to paste that in there. We now have our metadata. So we can say metadata. We'll just grab the first 50 characters. We'll do an array slice on that. And you'll see this little string right here is the beginning of an XML document. So here it's got an angle bracket, a question mark, XML version, and then 1.0. And then it's going to jump into some things called namespaces that we won't get into. We're going to ignore them for today. So now we've got the metadata text. Now we want to turn it into an element tree. Before we do that, let's save this out so we can pull it up in Emacs and have it on the side as a reference. So what we can do is we can create a file that we're writing. So we can say out equals open. And then I'm going to hit tab, backup, and replace bag with XML, comma. And then I'm going to use a string that's just a W that says we're going to open this for writing. Hit enter. So now we have type out. We have a file that we're writing. We can say out.write and pass it our metadata.txt. Hit enter. And then we can close out.close our file. We've now written that metadata to the disk. So if we do an ls-l, you should see right here our metadata written to the disk. We can tell, if you guys remember before we played with the editor, we can tell the editor, you can either do an Emacs client, no wait, something like that with an exclamation point in front of it, or you could say edit. So I'm going to say edit dash x means please do not execute this because normally when you're working in IPython, it tries to execute anything that you edit. H1 tab XML. I'm going to press enter. It's going to pop up this file in Emacs. And it's going to say waiting for Emacs. If you notice down at the bottom, control X pound is the character that you can use for telling it is done. So we'll do control X pound and then IPython gets to run again. So that loaded up our XML file in there. And if we go back here, we can actually do something that makes it a lot nicer. Remember last time we went through all sorts of crazy Emacs commands? Yes? So if it didn't load and it says Emacs client can't find socket, you have, have you started the server? If you go into your Emacs window and do meta x server dash start, this should start the Emacs server mode that we did. We set this up a while back. And if you lost that from your .emacs, then you'll need to do that again. I'll do it right here. So we'll say meta x server start. In my case, I just restarted the server. And then you should be able to come back here and do the edit again. But let's go ahead. While you guys are, if you're still working on that, I'm going to do another one where we're going to, remember how we did that replace, the meta x query replace last time? Let's do it in Python, and I think you'll find it looks a lot simpler. So we can say out to, we're going to create a second file. We'll say uh, open, and instead we're going to say try to. Let's see if I can follow this exactly here. Let's just rename this three, and we'll skip the other example. And we need to open it for writing. And what we can do is say out to dot write, and we can say that metadata file. We don't really don't want to do that. So I can hit control K or control U. We'll just wipe out that line, start over. So to get out of that mode and get IPython back, you do a C, X, and then the hash or pound character. Let's do that replacement before we did the uh, angle brackets and put a new line in between. So if we look at this text, we can say metadata.txt. There's a replace command. And we can replace one string with another. So last time we replaced the angle brackets with a new line in between. So if we do angle brackets, that would do nothing, but we want to put a slash n. And in strings in Python and in many other programming languages, a backslash and the letter n represents a new line. And if you hit enter, it looks pretty hideous. You'll see lots of slash n's. That doesn't really feel like very much. But if you do a print in front of that, if you run this print, the print will actually evaluate those new lines and they'll actually cause a new line to be in your display. So hit return on this one and hopefully you'll see metadata that looks more like what we had formatted in Emacs before. So I press enter. Now it's one per line 
and you can see all the different metadata in there. So why don't we write that out to the out to. So we'll say out to dot write. So one thing we can do, control U wipes out the line, and we'll say out to dot write. I'm going to do edit paste. And we're going to write that replace text into a file. And we'll say out to dot close, close it, ls dash l. And now we have another file, try three right here. And we can say edit dash x h115 dash try three xml. And that looks more like what we wanted to have. So I'm going to go ahead and do the control x pound to say I'm done editing it. And we now have our IPython back. So now we have text that we can look at. And we want to be able to grab things like title right out of this XML file. So what we need to do is use LXML to parse this XML file. And then we can use this XPath search thingy that I haven't really explained very well to go in there and grab out tags data. So what we can do is just say, please go into this document, go find me the first title and grab whatever is between these tags and just give that back to me as a string. And we can go in and say, I'd like the date, please. I'd like the abstract. I'd like the, the latitude and longitude bounds. We can ask for them by name without having to search through the whole text and deal with angle brackets and things like that. I'm going to split this and go back to my org mode file. And the way we ask element tree to parse some data is right up here. You use the eTree module and you say from string and you pass it the metadata text and it goes off and does some stuff. And then unfortunately there's this extra little sneaky step on the end. Once it's done the parsing, it's built some little object and we need to get the root node of that tree so we can look at it. So I'm going to go ahead and run that command. And if you've had trouble with writing the files, don't worry about that. We don't need the files for the rest of class. We're going to reach into here and we're going to ignore those files and just start pulling things out of the data. So we'll do a root equals eTree from string. Meta, and we'll give it the metadata text. So right there. And then we'll ask it for the get root tree. Hit enter. And we have this root thing set. Don't worry about the details, but this is a representation of that file that we can then ask for data fields from. So let's try grabbing the title. So we'll say title equals root.xpath. And so xpath is this search engine built into XML. It's got some funky syntax. Slash slash is the representation of the start of your document. So it tries to treat it like a file system. So it's like the Unix or Linux file system where it's going to have various levels in it. So we'll do a search for title, hit enter. So what we've done up here, the xpath search tool. This is the top level of your document. Star says any path and go find me the first title that I can find. Is there a way to have it list all of the elements in its? Good question. Listing all the elements. If we just type title and press enter, turns out it, I lied. It wasn't looking for the first one. It was going to return all of them. So we get a list. In this case, there's only one title. And so we have a list of one. So it'll give us a list of every single title that was in there if there were multiple ones. That's considered an array of all the titles. The square brackets uh -huh. tells us that we have a list. Element title at and a really horrible number is just kind of ugly. But this has given us a list of one title. If there were more of them, there would be more things on there. But there is no way to, I guess you have to know the structure of the XML uh -huh. document before you start doing this in order to query for tags that you want. Is there a way to? to load like a big XML unknown document and say, okay, well, give me a list of the tags. Um, you can do that kind of stuff. There's a different kind of interface for that. It's not okay. very fun. Okay. So we can definitely go through and list all of the tags. Here we can just load it up and we know we have an example of what the spec looks like. And so we can see that we want to get the title out of it and the abstract. All right, so let's pull out the title from that list. And we only want the first one. So we'll say title equals title sub zero. So we'll grab that first one out. So now if we just say title, we have an element. Not the most fun, but let's say title, period, and then hit tab. There's a ton of stuff in here. 
But the ones we want, tag, are these tags inside the angle brackets, and text is the text in between that. So ignore everything else and just say tag. So the tag is title, not too surprising. If we say text, there is the actual title text of this bag. It gives you that list based on you using XPath, or would that have been yes. the options for any list? What this is with XML, we've gotten we've done a search. We get back a list of little sections of our XML document, and we've in this case we only have one section. And then you can go into that section and work with it. And thankfully here text is very simple. There's just text inside of a node, mm -hmm. and it isn't this recursive structure that goes way down in like some of them do. We've gotten back a representation of just this part of the document. So if we asked for something else like CI date, if we asked for this guy right here, we would get back something that also contains date and date type. We would get back this whole block and it would have some children part of a tree. It gets a little complicated. So don't, don't stress about this too much. I just wanted you to see an example and see that once you get to know the tool, reaching in and grabbing a node that you need can be very easy. Understanding the whole document and what's there, uh, I would say probably not easy. And writing complicated XPath is uh, definitely a talent that some people have that I don't really have. So let's go ahead and try to make this title command into something that actually grows and grabs the title the way we want. So if we go back up to our XPath, really what we wanted to do is we're going to get back a list and we want to grab the first element of that. So we'll do uh, grab the first one from there. And we really didn't want that because that gave us this element that we didn't really, that gave us that horrible printing that said element and some evil number. We wanted to get the dot text. So that's the command we actually wanted to have to grab our title. So if we say title now, we just have the text for our title. So if you're building a, a plot and you were going to title it with the title, well, actually you don't want to use this title because it's not a, not a great title. But that's how we pulled out a tag. So let's do a couple more. Let's try the abstract. So if we look at our document here, if I do a control S abstract, we can see that our abstract right here, that's the text we want to be able to grab out. So if we say abstract equals root dot xpath, and now you have an example to copy from up above. So slash slash star, meaning anywhere in the document, give me all the abstracts, and then abstract. So this text right here, the abstract is this tag right there that we want to find. We want to get the first one, square brackets and a zero, and dot text. So hit enter, cross your fingers, and now type abstract. If all goes well, we see the abstract of our document. And last class, there was some question about dates. Why does the date up here say 2008 when the survey was done in 2007? That was a good catch that there was some confusion in there. That's the date that this, I believe that the, the bag file was created. So the survey was done in 2007, as you can see down here in the abstract. And this date up here was the date the bag was created, not the date the data was collected. So it's one of those things where if you're really going to dig into this stuff heavily, I would recommend reading up on the bag specification and getting all the details about all the parts. Because seeing just date, it can lead you down the wrong road if you get the wrong assumption about what a field means. There's not really enough information to understand all of the tags in this document. I've definitely been bit by some wrong assumptions. So that gives us our title and abstract. Now, if we want to get the longitude, so I did a control S and L-O-N-G to search. Inside our document is actually the bounding box for the text. So remember control S and Emacs is search. Yeah. Uh, so, how did you get that? so I have a typo in the notes. Is that what I hear? Yeah, like let's uh, let's take a quick peek. Yep, there is a typo right there. I was missing a single quote. So you guys get an A for following directions, and I get an F for not creating directions that are right. <laughs> All right. So let's go grab our bounding box coordinates using the same strategy. So we'll say X min and jump back here. So we'll say xmin equals float because I want to turn that string that's a number into an actual number. root.xpath 
start my search string, slash slash star, so anywhere, west, bound, longit, oh, there's too many opportunities for typos. And again, we want to grab the first one that we find out of that list, and we want the text, and the, then remember that we need to close that parenthesis. So I think the this parenthesis I'm on right now matches this one over here. So if I hit enter, index list out of range. That means I typed something wrong. Long, and I misspelled longitude. And that looks better. So if I type x min, I now have our minimum x value. I don't know what happens when you go over the date line. So I encourage you to find a bag that spans the uh, international date line and see what happens. You'll probably have the world come crashing down on you. So we can also, we can, I'm just going to paste these. These are too complicated to type. So I'm going to grab those guys, meta w, and I'm going to paste. So now if I type who's, hit enter, and if you look down here, we have our bounding box. Now this is a really important check because some of the early bag writing software didn't do bounding boxes correctly. So if you tried to just use the, the metadata to go figure out where everything was, you got one of the bags that was put up on NGDC was coming from central Canada on land, covering about half a province. So it's great to write your own code to check this stuff and to make a little visualization of it. So what we're going to do now is try to make a Google Earth KML that actually puts this on the globe in 10 minutes or less. We won't probably make it, but we'll get close. What I'm going to start off with is I'm going to teach you guys there's a templating language inside of Python where you can basically create a file that's got little parts that are missing in it. For example, if you're trying to create a metadata file, you could cut out all like the title and the abstract and you want to put in your own. Python gives you a way to take something like a file like that and to write in variables by name. Um, the typical way that people do this before was you say like, hello, percent %d for a number, world, and then percent, and then a list, and we say like, one, two, three, four, and it would then use these percents and then numbers and floats and strings to take the values out of this list, and you would have to make sure that the number of them matched up. I think this is really error prone and a pain. So I'm going to show you the new style, and if you're using Pydro, if you're a NOAA person, Pydro uses Python 2.5. This feature starts in Python 2.6. So if you're a Pydro user, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work for you. And you have to encourage the Pydro authors to maybe upgrade to a newer version of Python. But let's go ahead and give it a go, and we'll start right here. So the way it works, and there is another typo in my notes. I was missing another single quote, which they seem to like to get away today. So the way it works, my value. So you put your variable names in curly braces inside of a string. And then on that string, you call the dot format method. And it will then process that string and replace variables. So go ahead and hit enter. And you should get an error. You'll get a key error. If you search for plot the bounding box, so control S plot the and you should find it, and Control S will wrap around. Oh, you know what? I see that uh, I have another bug here. Somehow I bumped a character and I caused it to. There's this thing that says comment right here. That caused the export mode to not export this entire section. And so I think this was the, I leaned on the keyboard at an inopportune time and didn't notice that it changed something. It was there when I exported it, and I told it not to export this section. I highly recommend sticking with the org file during class. And even then, you might have trouble. <laughs> yeah, after class, I will re-export it with everything there. <laughs> OK, so let's get back to our uh, string here, now that we've gotten rid of those troubles. And what you can then say is, my value equals, and you could say, hello, world. You can pass it a string, and it will stuff whatever you put in there into that space. We can also replace that string with a number, so 123.45, and it will stuff the number in there. So rather than having to remember percent %d, percent %f, and then counting 1234 throughout your string, you can do this and call things by name. 
which I find much easier to follow, you know, six months after you've written the code and come back to it. You just look for the variable name and then you look at what the value is. So let's spend a couple minutes and get better at that. Switch over to our xmin and start doing our bounding box. So if we do xmin dot format, xmin, that'd be better, equals xmin, hit enter, and it went into that variable, pulled it out of our local variables. So we, we pull this out, we do um, control R, xmin, hit control R again to keep searching back. So we had grabbed xmin with this command right here. I'm just gonna hit control C. So don't run that command, you don't need to run it again. Now we can also do multiple variables at the same time. So if we take that command and we replace and y max, then we have to go into our parameters for format and we have to set the value for y max. Now I'm gonna throw in an extra example that's not in the notes because I realize it's confusing. We can make this whatever we want. So we can set that to be wahoo. This might be a little more obvious what's going on. So what you've done is you set a variable equal to some value, and then that name that was on the left over here is put into the variable in the string. So we can hit enter, and it's now stuffed that in there. You can use the same variable for both. You can say ymax equals ymax, and it will cause inside of the string the ymax variable to have that value that was ymax outside. I just realized that's a little confusing. Real quick, the, the format, um, usually when you do the percent D and stuff, you're telling it, I want it to format as an integer. How, how do you specify that here and say, well, I, I just wanted to float with one. If you, if you want to carefully format numbers like floating points and whatnot, there's all kinds of extra stuff to be able to do that. You'll have to go read the web page and go through it. Here, we're just going to take the default behavior and everything and try to keep things simple. So it's just going to call, what it actually is doing is the equivalent of doing this call, str of ymax, and getting a string back. That's the equivalent of what it's doing. You can get really fancy with this. It's got some really powerful features, but I haven't explored them too much, because the, what you get is a little hard to read sometimes. So let's say we're going to skip the bounding box one, and I'm going to show you the really great command. We're going to skip the, the middle part, and you can read the notes. If we say locals, this is a function that will actually create a dictionary of everything in your local, what you get back with whose. So hit enter and you will see, oh dear, don't do that. We've got a lot of data loaded up right now, <laughs> like 30 megabytes of data loaded into our locals. And life is really bad. And so with that, I think we're going to declare today done. <laughs> because every time we run locals, which is the last couple things we're going to do, it's going to take all of that data that I loaded up in there, and it's going to make us sit through it all. So we don't want to do that. And it's time to end class for today. That's spectacular. How would you save the template? So in the notes uh, that we didn't get to, I have a template that's a KML file. And you save that on disk, and you can do a, an open command of a file. That's just going to keep going. Go away. We'll just go down here. So here is a sample of KML that I've got. So you save that into a file. And right here, I call open of that template dot read, pull that all into a variable. And then we can then say kml underscore template dot format star star locals is this special trick to pull locals mm -hmm. into format. And magically, you have a KML file with everything filled out that you ever wanted. We're going to do a couple more examples of this. And by the end of the semester, I'd like you guys to be hopefully able to write out, create a template for metadata, find out all the values out of some data, and then fill out the metadata so that you can actually create your own metadata for some other kind of data that you're interested in. So that's the goal that we're aiming towards here, is being able to build these template files. So if you've gone through ISO metadata, which is really complicated, you can build yourself a template, put in the curly braces for things like you know author and date and all that stuff, use Python to generate all that data, and then you call this dot .format, boom, it shoves all the two together, and you have valid ISO metadata that you can then send off to NGDC when you submit your data. That's the goal of what we're aiming for, and we're, we're good ways away from that, but we're getting there. So we'll keep going through this. We'll do some more examples of reaching into XML, building KML, and you'll see a lot of different versions of XML, and hopefully it'll start becoming more familiar over the next few classes. All right, guys.
Uh, not too much, no. No, it's pretty permissive on spaces. There's a few places where it has to have some sort of space, but it doesn't care what kind of space. <laughs>